Okay, we're recording. Hello everyone, this is the Late Morning Program with Namras. This is a remote edition with my guest, uh, Brahma Muhurta Das, a good friend of mine. Uh, we're doing this all remotely because of coronavirus uh, that's happening right now in uh, the whole world. And um, so we thought to do a remote podcast regarding different aspects of deity worship and puja and archana and things like that. We had a few questions from Facebook. Uh, so uh, Brahma, how's it going? Good. How are you? Doing good, man. Uh, just quarantine. the coroni beard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm here reporting from the, the banks of the causal, causal ocean. That's the safest place to be right now. <laughs> okay, so let's check out these questions. Um, okay. So first of all, there's a question regarding... Um, I'm not supposed to touch my face now. Oh yeah, I think I just did touch, I think I just touched my face too. It's impossible. <laughs> all these things, all these, all the rules are, are, are all the basic rules you learned in the ashram. That's to, right. Um, you know, cleanliness, like, um, what else? Like, sorry, someone's just pressing buttons in the other room that made a lot of noise. Um, like, uh, you know, washing your hands, not wearing your shoes from outside, not going to the wet market, um, trying to, uh, the idea between pure and, and clean. Yeah. Uh, th that sort of distinction. Right. Like, keeping things really sterile yeah. right? and really thinking it may look clean, but it's not pure. Right. You know, that the stand, like, you know, if one devotee would say, like, if you ate chips and then you, um, if you eat chips and you're like, Oh, I, I, I want to clean my hand. Maybe you wipe it on your jeans, you know, <laughs> like both sides and you're like, okay, they're clean. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, for all intents and purposes, when you look at it, it may look, they may look clean, but they're not pure. So all right. the cooties are still in them. You're still going to get the roni. Okay? <laughs> so you got you to gotta wash your hands really well. Yes. Thoroughly. Like there's that, the thing of like the guy with the black, with the black ink he puts on his hands. Did you see that video now? No. So the guy has like rubber gloves and he puts a little bit of black like paint in his hands. So it's like soap and he rubs his, washes his hands like how we normally do like that. And then you see, it's just like, it's only here. But you have to wash like that, like oh, that, right. this. Hari Bhakti Vilas even gives that whole description of how to wash hands. And they say, oh, like, how many times? Is it? Oh, I think I saw um, a video of Janani Vasprabhu uh, saying, like, it's, it's like 19 times. Like, this is considered one or something like that. Yeah, each. I think it's, like, depending on what you're doing, how many times you have to wash your hands, how many times you have to rinse out your mouth. And it seems excessive and, and, you know, a little OCD, but I think it's really, yeah, uh, no problem. It's, yeah. it, it, you know, it makes sense. Now you see, this is what happens. You know, I was watching that movie Contagion yesterday. Have you seen yeah. it? Yeah, that was an interesting pronunciation. <laughs> so my wife tells me, like, you keep pronouncing it wrong. I don't know how to pronounce it. Contag Contagion? <laughs> Contagion. Oh, contagion. I mean, right. there's probably some some MD. Brudge Bumi may may chime in and say we're both doing it wrong. But as far as <laughs> as anyway, that movie was scary, man. Oh my gosh, that like the what what could happen? You know, like if it all became like super contagious and like people were you know, and it was like the mortality rate was like a few hours and you would just die if you got it. Yeah. Crazy. Anyway, I keep touching my nose because it's itchy. Um, okay, let's get into these questions here. Okay. Why is it that temple constructions follow astrology for milestones in construction, i.e. so-and-so day and time is the best for laying foundation, and so-and-so time is best for installing chakra? I understand if it was someone's own home and they were being thusly influenced by astrology, but why is it that Krishna's home can be negatively affected the implications of doing things at an auspicious time is also that it can be inauspicious to do at other times by positioning of his subordinate demigods. Good question. Yeah, just trying to make sure I followed it all. Um, so the question is, 
why are for our temple do we have to follow all these rules in terms why can't we just build it whenever because if it's a demigod that's involved like say exactly there's different planetary influences so then um those planets should be subordinate to the lord so then why do we have to follow their rules not just the lord's rules exactly exactly yeah. i think that's the gist of the question yes it is um I mean, the thing is, is because the Lord put them in charge of all those things. So the Lord, this is all the Lord's rules, this whole world and how everything functions. He put it into place. So we're honoring that system. Also, it's, it's like, sure, you can do, like, in, in my experience of doing rituals, you can do something um, at another time, meaning you're capable, your body's capable of doing it. Not that Shastra is saying you should do it at any time you want. But what happens is, is that every single thing in the, in the universe is set up to go in a really, things are all starting at the same time. Um, you know, like in the spring, things are blooming, people are going outside, um, the sun is out, like the, everything is moving in a really specific way. Just like if you build a pool, if you want to dig a pool, you dig it at a certain time of year. They're not following astrology. They're just following the times when construction is better. You dig it at a certain point and then you set it. And then, you know, you pour the concrete at a certain time of the year. And um, hold on one second. Yes, universal rhythm I've been given in a note. And speaking of which, maybe you can wait to cook until <laughs> after so that I, we can all be in rhythm. Um, so yeah, this is a, a really good point. There's a universal rhythm of when things are happening right throughout the year. So right. everyone follows this stuff. Uh, just like I think about, um, in terms of like an art fair. So maybe that's too esoteric or too, too specific of an example, but, <clears throat> but certain times. Certain things have to have have to happen at a certain specific time is what yeah, you're yeah. Pointing. So now then let's think, okay, when we move, that's like uh, according to material culture, certain things happen at certain times of year, always. There's certain conventions that happen at certain times of year. So then you're gonna your company gets ready at that specific time of year for that specific convention. They're not gonna get ready in the same way at another time of year. So, okay, so that's that. You can say then, okay, those things are just material. They're not considering the Lord. Now, the Lord has set up all these rules. And as much as we are disconnected directly and completely surrendered to the Lord, we still have to follow all those rules. And even when we're completely surrendered to the Lord, we still follow the rules because, they, because he put those rules in place. They're for his pleasure. So using the example of when I would do a puja, because I'm not completely surrendered. I'm just trying to follow the rules. If I do a puja and it's not at the right time, I've noticed it's like an uphill battle. You can get the thing done, but it doesn't go as smoothly. Interesting. But sometimes wow. you do something and you figure out the right time and you figure out the right place and everything. It just goes smoothly. Like the other day when we did the Sudarshana Homa in Chicago, all the flights, everything went smoothly. Right. The timing of everything, yeah. it just everything fell together and there was no tension. It was just very, like, very smooth. So that, that's why, because it's to try and dissipate the anxiety of everyone who's involved so everything can go smoothly right. and without too much stress because it's already a lot so people can focus. So you do things at specific times of year so that there's focus, just like you're not going to have a big flower festival when there's no flowers because it's impossible to get that. So the Lord has created things on a specific schedules because that's how the seasons work. So when we're doing construction, we're gonna consider what's a good time, what nakshatra, all these things that like, whether it's seasonal, so um, whether it's uh, in Uttarayana or Dakshinayana, whether it is a specific nakshatra that will give particular influence of that, uh, good or bad, and you can say, now the question comes, how does that, or is that just superstition? Because we're so disconnected from the, um, from the natural world that sometimes we think of it as like superstition. I've heard even Bhakta say this. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, heard that as well. That, oh, this is just superstition, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, the thing is, is it's, it's not, it's, we're just disconnected. Prabhupada 
would travel on certain days. You know, he believed in those things. It didn't completely, it didn't paralyze him from doing anything. Yes. But he, he did follow many of these things. He told Prajumna Prabhu, well, if you know some astrology, it's like this. If you know it's raining, you bring an umbrella. You should be right. prepared for what you're dealing with. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, they'll affect us. So it's just like, we may think, oh, how does the sun affect you? How does the moon affect you? What are, like, those are clear things that affect us that everyone accepts. The sun, if we don't get enough sun in the winter, you get seasonal affective disorder. You get depressed mm -hmm. because you don't get the right vitamins from the sun. The moon affects us. People, women's cycles are based on the moon. Emergency rooms get filled up at the full moon. The tides are, are connected to the phases of the moon. Um, those are things because they're closer. The moon is a satellite that's close to us. It, it's very clear and there's more of a gross effect. The sun we can clearly get. It's the same thing. It's all the different light that's affecting, that's bouncing off all these other planets and how they affect our, our particular energy. And then uh, the times of the year and how, where the sun is situated and that affects us. So we take all of that into account because you can go up to a guy, a, a contractor who doesn't believe in any of this stuff and say, I want to build a temple. It's December in Chicago. And he's going to look at you like you're crazy. You know, say, well, it's for the Lord. I want to build it now. Good point. It's not about you. Or you say, the Lord came to me. He's going to say, it's impossible because the ground is frozen. We can't build anything right now. Yeah. So yeah. it's just that in a more subtle way. We have to understand what things are complementary. So it's not about like, oh, well, my God is higher. You know, Krishna is higher than one of the other devatas that are in the Vastu Mandala. And so, you know, we should consider it's, it's just common sense. Right. That, that's very good point. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Um, that, I, I feel like there was more to that question, but I. No, no, that's that, that, that answered it. And again, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to repeat the things I've learned from my teacher. I'm not some Acharya that's going to sit and pontificate and no, no, no. I'm giving perfect answers to perfect questions or something. No, no, no. We're not taking I, it like that. I think you have a lot of uh, knowledge uh, in this field. So like, it's natural that when I ask people if they want to say, ask something, then we, then we ask you because you have a, a lot of knowledge on this. So the next, it's just a way to start a conversation. Exactly. Yeah. So the next question is, what is the significance of taking RT from the ghee lamp, taking RT as it says, after it has been offered? Sometimes we see that the pujari also takes it. If they have offered the ghee lamp, then why do they also take the RT over their eyes and head? Some of these questions are not completely clear, so I'm gonna try and answer it as best as possible. I think the question is, why do we, why do we touch the flame Exactly. Yeah. Why do we touch the flame? I mean, my understanding, and I think there's a, there's a lot of explanations on what the RT signifies, what the offering of the lamp rather, let's be specific. Yeah. Um, what it signifies, what it means. There's esoteric meanings, there's tantric meanings. Um, my understanding is it's just to take the prasadam of the Lord. Yes. And, and like that, there's different ways people will get more elaborate, touching their eyes, their hearts, all, you know, all over. But the main thing is just to take it as prasadam. That's all. Right. Now, whether uh, I didn't understand the question of the pujari takes so it. Sometimes and then, we see that the pujari also takes it. So like they offer it and then after they offer it and it goes to everyone, they'll also take the prasad. Uh -huh. so, so they can yeah, that's the prasad as well. Okay. Um, next question. Why is it important to have Garuda on your bell and Ananta Shesha on your ghee lamp? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's easy. No, there, no, no, I mean, there's, there's, it's, I've never read something that it, there are descriptions of different, there's different types of lamps. There's ones with Ananta, there's a Shanka Chakra lamps, there's a Kurma Deepa. Um, I don't think that it says you can only use one but there are different descriptions of different types of lamps. Uh, one of them has Ananta. Sometimes uh, there's bells that have Garuda. They have um, uh, Hanuman. The Madhvas often have Hanuman. Right. Uh, Shaivites have uh, Nandi on their bell. Um, oh man, I have a bell with Nandi on it. Yeah. 
So people have different bells. Uh, they'll have um, Shankar Chakra also. Right, I've seen that, yeah. The three Vaishnavas will have Shankar Chakra. Um, so it's to taste how they decorate it. And they may have a different prayer for the bell and how they handle the bell. Right. Um, but it's not like it has to have only Garuda or it has to have only Anantasesha. There are different types of lamps and there are different types of bells. Um, yes. So. Okay. Um, Hari Bhakti Vilas says that conversation that is not about the present deities should not be had in front of them when they are giving darshan. Yet many senior devotees have personal conversations in front of darshan giving deities at the temple. Is it therefore that this rule only applies to the pujaris on the altar and not those that are taking darshan in the temple room? Mm, that's a good question. I can't speak as to why people do what they do. I can only repeat <laughs> what it says in Shastra, you know? Right. Um, for sure, you're not supposed to talk about anything other than the deities in front of the deities because that's their space. It's just like a, a, king, a king, you know, is there. Or any guest, if you have someone and then you invite them and you're, or you go to someone's house and then you're just having a side conversation in front of them and they're just there. Yeah. It's a little rude. It's so little, yeah. I think sometimes we get a little familiar in front of the deities because we're there every day. We're in the temple room every day. So we don't always observe all those things. But at least the way I was initially trained, um, even as like a young bhakta, I was told you shouldn't even practice like you shouldn't practice murdanga or harmonium or anything in the temple room. The temple room is for one specific purpose. Right. Uh, it's, it's for glorifying. It's the Lord's place. It's his place. Even traditionally, you wouldn't have a wedding in a temple room. Um, right. No manusya karma is just, just deva takarias. Um, because that's, that's his place. You have a hall, you do everything there, and then you can come get the blessings of the Lord. But that's his realm. So all the, sometimes people may think, oh, well, it's connected to the deities in some way. But I would veer... And not that I always practice it. Um, I would, yeah, generally, not generally, you're supposed to just talk about the deities in front of the deities. It's not just the pujaris. It's when you're in the deity space and you observe all those things. Right. Um, and then there's a second part of the question. Same question applies to non-essential conversations during kirtan. Is it true that when kirtan is being performed, that since Krishna's name is non-different than his form, uh, from his form, that the same Hari Bhakti Vilas Didi offenses also apply in Kirtan. I'm not in the position to make that call to say, you know, yes, it's the same thing, but it, in essence, it's the same that you should be respectful. If you're in, just like how you would with any, if you're a sensitive person and you have a guest or anyone in your, with you, you respect them. So, when there's kirtan happening, you shouldn't be having side conversations. If you're in the kirtan, if you have to speak to someone, then you should excuse yourself and have a conversation with them. But it's very hard for people to focus when they're chanting, whether it's japa. So sometimes it's the same thing. Someone's chanting japa. Sometimes it's a weird thing, I think, that we have where maybe you've also noticed this, Nam. Like, uh, I remember as a young bhakta, if someone's chanting japa, it's okay, you can go up and talk to them. Yes. <laughs> but, if they're chanting, but if they're chanting their Gayatri, they'll just ignore you. If you go up and you'll, they'll just look straight, sometimes they'll, they'll go like that to let you know, but yeah. they won't respond. And yeah. the first time I ever saw that, totally, I was like, what is he doing? What's going on? I thought we're not yogis. Because the guy was just sitting straight and, and, and cross-legged. Um, but for some reason, when someone's chanting Japa, you can go up and ask them wherever the hell you want. Yeah, and, that's, that's and, very. Uh, and they may come up to you and talk and chant in between uh, when they're talking to you and be like, uh huh. And while you're talking, they're chanting. And then, uh, and then they'll respond. And at a certain point, you're like, what are you doing? You're, you're being disrespectful to both me <laughs> and the names. <laughs> and you're not really engaging in either of them. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's, so it's a, it's a hard, th at the same time, sometimes people are just, you know, want to chant whenever they can and have free time, you know, whenever they have the free time, but it's a weird thing, just like in Kirtan, just like in Vedis, it should extend to all aspects of our practices.
that they should be respected. When we're, when we're engaged in one thing, our, our mind should be completely focused on that and be able to, it's hard. It's Very hard. Yeah. the mind. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, I would say, it, you know, the idea of like extending it, is it the same level of operat or is it the same? I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know the charts and balances and the cat that's I Indra Prabhu was always good with like uh, spiritual math. Right. <laughs> you know, more in the positive. Like he wouldn't I, I never heard him saying like, oh well that's an offense, so then that's multiplied. It was more like if you uh, if you if you re if you worship a shalagram, you get one thousand times the benefit if there's this many shalagrams, and if you're in Vrindavan, then you get a thousand times that. And if you're during Karti, then you get a thousand times that. And then Sotama Mas is 35,000 times that. So then that's one million times, a thousand times, a thousand times, a thousand. That's 555 billion times. <laughs> Rebel Horta, that's 500. You just do it one time. And you would go into those things. Yeah, right. But, uh, I, I always looked at it more like it's really good. It's really yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if if, if how how you quantify it in the, in the same way. If, yes. If there is... Uh, uh, some form of the Lord with an abacus um, <laughs> trying to work out the math. Right. Yes. Uh, I don't, I don't know if okay. Like good, good. Okay, uh, next one. This is, a, this is a good question. I think a lot of people have questions about this. Mm. Who can worship Shalagram Shila and Govardhan Shila? Okay. Please provide Shastra quotes for this one as there are many opposing viewpoints. Okay, so I want to give a little bit of background regarding okay. this question. Um, so I tried to find Shastra quotes regarding, um, and I also asked you about this, you know, a few days back regarding how to, uh, you know, navigate this and, and find it in Shastra. So I think you found something, and I personally couldn't find anything that said that you have to have, um, that you have to have uh, mantra diksha for, for the, I could be uh, wrong, and I, and, I, and I, everyone who I've heard from has said that you have to, so if you could please uh, shed some light on that. Okay. So there's, before I get too into it, one thing, this is what has been done by our Acharyas, right? So I'll just read a few quotes. People want quotes. Um, so Hari Bhakti Vilas, uh, Vilas 2, 3 to 4 expands on the necessity of taking initiation. Um, actually, okay, and this is, I think, from Bhakti Pramod Puri uh, Maharaj's book. If you can explain, uh, if you can explain who that Maharaj is and what his significance okay. is for us. Bhakti Pramod Puri Maharaj was the, um, was a godbrother of Prabhupada, a disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada, a basically him and Vaikana Samaraj were the main people who did all the installations in the Gaudiya Mat, um, and did a lot of research. And he was known as sort of the, one of the experts and authorities on deity worship. Okay. Um, so, and how do, he, he writes in his book on the Guru, um, it's Hari Bhakti Vilas 2, 3 to 4 expands on the necessity of taking initiation just as one born in a Brahmana family cannot engage in Vedic rituals without being first being invested in, with a sacred thread similarly no person has the right to engage in chanting the mantra or worshipping the deity without first being initiated therefore one should become praised by Shiva, Shiva uh, himself by taking initiation in his commentary on this verse so Sanatan Goswami gives commentary on Hari Bhakti Vilas. The one by that you see doesn't have the commentaries, the one that like uh, Rasvi Harla printed. So oh. it's really important to have access also to the Digdarshini Tika. Um, so Sanatan Goswami states that since no one is permitted to eat without first offering his food to the deity and since initiation is necessary, prerequisite to deity worship, it is clear that initiation is absolutely necessary. The inference meaning that if you don't take initiation, you can't eat because you can't worship the deity because 
you, you have to offer everything to the deity. So you have to be initiated in order to worship the deity. So if you want to live, you have to be initiated because you have to eat. It's a little like a, a bit of a reductionist viewpoint, but. Right. Uh, Sanatan Gos, uh, uh, Srila Sanatan Goswami goes on to say that even though the worship of Shalagam Shila is what is being specified here, initiation is in fact necessary for requisite for all kinds of service to Krishna, not simply for worship of his deity form. Well, so that's even more. It's not even just doing archana. It's everyone has to, if you want to worship Krishna in any way, you have to take initiation. Wow. So is there a mantra? Mantra is involved. The mantra that you get, you have to use that mantra for the worship. It's not just you just worship without, based on anything like. Yeah. Well, let, let me get to that. I have a few more. And then. Okay. And then uh, no, no, it's okay. Just because people are asking. Let's give some quotes, you know, so it's not just me talking. Right. Um, Hari Bhakti Vilas, Fifth Vilas, verse 374. Um, some of them, and, and I'm trying to look actually from both sides because some of them are a little bit vague. Um, let me just make sure that this one is. Okay, if the most sinful uh, people worship Lord uh, Achuta in his form as a Shalagam Shila, then they can be rele relieved from being born among animals or insects or other hellish conditions, as well as from suffering in the womb. I assure you that if a person who has been initiated, thus has received the bona fide mantra, worships me with offerings in my Shalagam Shila form, he will be transferred to my supreme abode. So point here is that they must be initiated in order to get that benefit. Um, then we have, you know, uh, okay, here. It may, this is from Bhakti Bhaktivinoda Puri Maharaj's uh, Art of Sadhana, quoting Hari Bhakti Vilas, second Vilas, verse 10. It may be asked that since there are descriptions in the scriptures of great benefits to be derived from even negligent worship of deities such as Shalagram Shila, then what need is there of taking shelter of a spiritual master and being initiated by him? Whoa. But the fact is that, so he quotes it in a second, but he gives the preamble. But the fact is that one will not derive full benefit from his puja if he ignores the established etiquette of worshiping the guru before worshiping the deity. Therefore, he quotes a verse, um, therefore, everyone should surrender to a bona fide spiritual master and after offering him everything, body, mind, and property, should take the Vishnu mantra from him according to the appropriate rites of initiation. So his point of you have to worship the guru means you have to have a guru and the guru has to have accepted you and you're initiated. It's not just a vague notion of a guru. Um, so, so then we have a few verses. I can dig up more, but uh, you know, the thing is with that sort of thing, you can go back and forth where you're just sending verses and then they'll find something that says, you know, anyone can get uh, liberated, blah, blah, blah. The thing is, is at the end of the day, what did our acharyas do? That's the, that's the, our point. That's the point. That that's, I mean, for me, that's really the end of it. It's what did all these traditional Vaishnavas do? What did all, all these traditions have in common is initiation. Maybe I'm going to, say maybe maybe there's some examples out there of uh, anomalies but that's what they are they're anomalies just like i think jai bhaita maharaj would give this example I'm, i can't remember what it was in reference to but the analogy still works there are people who don't go to college who have phds in harvard from harvard right they were awarded an honorary phd because of some amazing work that they've done. And they were, you know, picked after some lifetime of, of innovation and amazing, you know, they're, they're just amazing at whatever it is that they're doing. And Harvard or Stanford or MIT or Columbia has decided we should give them an honorary PhD. It's honorary, it's not quite the same, but it's a, it's a PhD. Right. Now, all the people at Harvard that are professors, I don't know that they all have honorary PhDs. I don't know that even one single tenured professor has 
as his main PhD or her main PhD, it's honorary. That that's on the resume when she applied and said, no, I didn't go to school. I have these honorary PhDs. Maybe, maybe there's a few. But for the most part, all the people at that institution, which gives the institution all its credibility, have followed the process yes. of going through, getting their uh, you know, undergraduate, getting their master's, their PhD, or maybe before they were, before PhDs were common, they just have a master's, whatever. But they did the thing that was set up by that particular institution. They're not going and saying, well, there are these cases. So I'm just gonna, you know, do my thing, not really follow any of the rules or the systems that have been established by all the, you know, previous uh, teachers in that field or world. Yeah. In terms of how to educate myself or how to, um, you know, write and peer reviewed things and, and follow this whole system. And I'm just gonna hope by the mercy of Harvard or MIT and that I'll get that same qualification. But that's not really a good life plan. So all of the Acharyas, they say, get initiated. How do they say, if they're not explicitly saying it, they're doing it, they're showing how to do it. <laughs> yeah. They're, 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 they're getting initiated and then they're doing DD. You know, like this is the thing. There's these examples over and over and over again. So the people that say, well, you know, we don't need to be initiated to do this. You know, do whatever you want. But in terms of getting all the benefit, following the traditional methods, you do. And in all of these orthodox worlds, you do. Not just orthodox, but like in, in, in sort of if we're using it in a pejorative sense but all the tradition that we are a part of as Vaishnavas or as Gaudiya Vaishnavas or as people in ISKCON or the Gaudiya Mat or followers of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada or Bhakti Vinod Thakur it's you get it you have to get initiated that's there's an order when you get initiated there's Pancha Samskara so you have um you get Tilak you get your name you get um Maybe you get branded or you get Kanti Mala mm -hmm. and then you get Mantra. And then at the end is the Archavigraha and the right to worship. So what you were saying now, what were you, you were going to touch on this thing about what is, what is the Mantra, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just wanted to, to know. So if people who are worshiping the deity without having initiation, uh, what mantras are they using? Because you need those mantras to worship the deity. If you can elaborate on that. Yeah. So the mantras that we receive in second initiation are, they're not just, I think sometimes it's, it's underemphasized or we don't discuss it so much, but because it's confidential. Um, we have a few different mantras. I don't know if we talked about it this last time at all. No, no, we didn't. Oh, okay. Um, so we have five mantras that we get initiated into, uh, at, at what we call second initiation or Diksha. The first in ISKCON, the first many people is, is the, uh, Brahma Gayatri, the Vedic mantra, Vedic Gayatri. Okay. So that's a separate thing. Then we have these other mantras. So in the Gaudiya Mat, uh, they don't give it to everyone. Um, but then we have these other other mantras. And some people may get Brahma Gayatri from their father previously, if they're born into like a traditional Brahmin home, um, they'll get Upanayanam as, as a young person. Then we have these other mantras, a Guru Mantra, Gora Mantra, and a Krishna Mantra, and Gayatris for each one. So those are mantras in a specific meter called the Gayatri meter. The other are what are called Mula Mantras root mantras. And those are the mantras that we use for deity worship. Now, what does that mean? Without going into the depths and the um, specifics of the mantras, because again, they're um, sort of confidential, but I mean, there's a million books on all this stuff. Right. The mantras are the sonic form of the deity. So, 
the Krishna mantra is the deity, is Sham Sundar in Vrindavan, is Govinda in New York, is Murli Dar in the Bhakti Center. It is him directly in his sonic form, in his vibrational form. So when the guru gives that mantra, he's giving, or she, hopefully, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't care either way. <laughs> he or she, whoever is qualified, gives that mantra. Um, they're giving the deity in the, that sonic form. When the deity is installed, it is uh, by, part of that is building the deity out of that, uh, out of the mantra. Out of, so the deity comes out of the mantra and, and all the marble is destroyed and, it's, and the murti is made up of this uh, mantric material now, which is the seed of which is the japa of that mula mantra that's given by the guru. So when one does worship, even for those who are initiated, it's really important that we do intense japa of those mantras because we should be doing uh, mantra japa before we do our deity worship. Mm -hmm. And there are dhyana mantras also, if, you, if people like, they can add, which are meditational mantras on who is this uh, Krishna, Govinda, Gopi, Janavalava that we're meditating on. Mm -hmm. And we meditate on that and we chant the mantra and we can uh, get into the right place when we're chanting these mantras. And then there is some uh, meditation, there's focus, there's some, something there that when we worship the deity, there's a connection. Because when we're worshiping the deity, we'll call out that mantra, but it's also, we are um, you know, calling the deity into our heart by chanting that mantra and then we're, then that external manifestation of, that, of the mantra is the murti. So we have to first have the dhyana as the, in the mantra and then externally uh, comes as the deity. Right. So that's why we have to constantly also be doing japa of, of our um, diksha mantras if we want to do deity work. By japa, just, you mean, by japa you mean like the three sandhyams, how we do yeah, it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or you can chant more. You, know, right. you can chant more of the gopal mantra if you like. Right. I mean, so it's, it's about creating some momentum with the mantras also. So it's not just, okay, you get initiated, you get the mantra, and now you can do deity worship. So we're not saying, okay, if you get initiated, then you can do deity worship. But you also have to maintain a practice of doing mantra japa in order to do deity worship. So it's not just a matter of, I have the mantra, now I have the adhikar to worship the deity. You have to have a relationship with the mantra. The deity is the second part of it. And that's the external manifestation, but you have to have the internal relationship with the mantra or the deity in this mantra form. I've spoken to a lot of devotees that, um, are, you know, practicing devotees for quite a long time, but there's a lot of gray area on the explana these explanations of, of the second initiation uh, that the guru hasn't mm -hmm. necessarily given or Prabhupada hasn't, hasn't really elaborated so much on. Uh, do you know why that is? Why is there so much uh, unknown regarding this? I don't know. You'd have to ask, ask the people that give the mantras. Right. I mean, there's, there's, inform there's information there. Um, I think, you know, it's just like, I mean, again, I can't speak for why people do what they do or where they emphasize, you know, we're a relatively young movement. Right. And, you know, how many people have read all of the books that Prabhupada has given? It's a lot of it is there in Prabhupada's books. Um, it's just a matter of actually reading them, you know, not just that we distribute them, but we have to read them. Yes. Um, I always, I always like those points. Yeah. We have to, we it's have cool to, to get all the Lakshmi points, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we have to, <laughs> We have to read the, the books. Well, now so, the chance in the coronavirus time, there's no chance to distribute them. We all have to sit at home and read them. <laughs> I think people are still trying to distribute them in, in dynamic ways. Um, okay. but, but yeah, I think, um, yeah, now is the perfect time where people can go internally and pause. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, 
those of us who aren't working or aren't fortunate enough in a lot of ways to be able to work from home, um, you're kind of, the whole world is forced to pause right now. Yeah. So it's a really good opportunity because in a lot of ways, it's not like, oh, well, I can go hit the streets and find some other work if, if you're out of work right now. Right. It's, it's really, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's an unfortunate economic situation for a lot of people. Yes. Um, but it's an opportunity for something. And it's just a matter of figuring out what, what that is individually. But the idea of even, even if we're working, there's a pause. We can't go out. We can't socialize. We can't, you know, get distracted by the same things that we normally do. So we're able to, this opportunity to have, go deeper with our japa, with our maha mantra japa, with our diksha mantra japa, with our reading. Right. Um, but as far as what the original question is, I think it's just a matter of time, you know, people, the movement is relatively young. There's a lot of research that needs to be done. There's a lot of um, internal development that needs to be done. And not everyone, you know, all of these topics are confidential topics. So it's not like every, even within traditions where these things are well known, it's always well known within a small, you know, sect of, of, of people because people aren't really that interested in all these things anyways. Yeah. Um, so it's, but it may also be that, you know, for whatever reason, people aren't in the space and maybe they will be later on. But I, I do think that the, these mantras are underemphasized. Whenever the Goswamis talk about um, mantra japa, it's, that's what they're talking about is Gopal mantra japa, you know, and. Interesting. You know, it's a, it's a very, it's an integral part of our practice. Right. It just, you know, they, they've, they've written commentaries on all this stuff and it's just there for us to read. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, it all takes time. Right. And the, the original question had, um, who can also worship Govardhan, Sheila, if you could also elaborate on that a little bit. You know, Govardhan's a little harder uh, because Govardhan isn't, you don't find that tradition everywhere that's a real brudge tradition so you have uh the tradition in in brudge of you know bridge bossies worshiping govardhan i don't know what exactly their particular um sampradayic leanings are it's done from the heart so govardhan is worship with rag um, with deep attachment but and there's a village tradition there but for the most part people also say you shouldn't take govardhan out of brudge so, you know, I, people may worship Govardhan Hill without initiation because it's from the heart. They may worship him there. When you start taking him out of Brudge, out of his home, then things start to change because it's a formal thing. You're taking, you know, when you take someone, you really have to take care of them and follow more rules. When you're just visiting them in their home, then it's a little bit different. Um, oh, interesting. I've never heard it put that. I way. mean, maybe maybe it's not a, actually a good analogy, even because in their home they have their rules. But in their in, in Krishna's home in Braj, you go over done. It's just it's just about it's about the heart. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen, at least from and what I've heard, let's say, because I wasn't there, but Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada, he would give. Um, I think he gave to Ban Maharaj and to. Tirtha Maharaj. Tirtha Maharaj. One Govardhan, one Shalagram, one Dwarka Shila. And that was the tradition that they would all be together as a set when they would leave Raj, that uh, you would have the Shalagram and the Dwarka Shila together, not just Giriraj on its own. I don't know what the, you know, I can't speak more on that, but if we accept that Krishna is Giriraj, then we would follow the same rules. And, and we follow the, what the examples that are, again, we follow the examples of, of our previous acharyas and who had the adhikar to worship Giriraj. Um, but there's a lot, Giriraj is a, there's a lot of different traditions in Braj. And it's just a matter of, we also have to think, are we part of that particular tradition? Where does that tradition come from? What is the philosophical thing like you know, at one point, the idea of uh, the Barshana Shilas right. as Radharani. Yes. You know, I don't know where that, that came from. I mean, 
even locally, they, I remember talking to Dina Bandhu Prabhu, locally, Barsana Sheila, Barsana is considered like Brahma. So I don't know. I mean, maybe it's like Tadiya, so it reminds people of Radharani, but I don't know how that then becomes her actual complete body. You know, some of these things are also, they're private. So the problem is, is you may find some person who has a particular bhava and a particular vision of how they worship their deities. Yes. And that's a per- very personal thing. It's between them and their guru. Um, but now we have the internet. So bhava gets um, televised and then that stops being confidential. Mm-hmm. And then people copy it without having the understanding of the contextual understanding or you know, like there are things, I may see something in a temple in Brudge and, I'll, and I may think that doesn't make that much sense to me, mm. like the way it's arranged or something, but whatever, it doesn't have to. It's not, you know, like it's not, it's, if that is the case, that doesn't, it's not a criticism on those people. I may not have that particular vision and, you know, I may never have that vision. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. But if we're talking about Shastra and tradition within the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition and within, you know, uh, from Prabhupada, from Bhakti Siddhanta, from Bhakti Matakur, there are very clear things as to who can worship deities, whether it's Shalagram or Giriraj. Because so, sometimes we may think, oh, well, it's a village tradition. We can just do whatever we want. And you don't really see that. You know, you have to see Radha Raman Goswamis, what do they do? Um, and we're not, the, the village tradition is brudge. So it's not just like village in the, in the pejorative sense. It's the greatest village and everything they do is out of love from their hearts completely, or they have some, who knows what's going on in, in the hearts of the bridge bosses. So yes. that's not us. If a bridge bossy wants to do it, whatever, I don't, you know, who am I to say? Right. Good points. Very good points. Um, okay, moving on. What is the significance offering cloth? Usually seems to be a handkerchief during arti. Should it always be new? Um, my understanding of that is that it's a Bengali thing, the offering of the cloth during the arti. Um, and I haven't seen that it always has to be new. It's always nice if you offer something fresh and new, but it doesn't always have to be. But the significance is just like offering from, from this is what I've understood and, and heard is that it's like offering new, a new piece of cloth, you know, to a guest. All of these things are, it's not necessarily like, okay, you offer argument and then you're offering cloth to, and I could be wrong. So if, if someone has some other evidence, um, let me know, but I think because of the mantra, which I'm now forgetting, um, it's offering just cloth. It's not offering a towel. I think it's Idam Vastram. Yeah, Anga Vastram. So Anga Vastram, it's for offering a cloth to put on them, as opposed to um, a towel, which is a different mantra, which I'm forgetting right now. No, I think Anga Vashram is, ta- is a towel and bus- just Vashram is what I was taught. There's another one for, for, there's another one for a towel also. Okay. Anga Vashram just means like the top cloth. But maybe, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn with that particular thing. But my understanding is, I, I do know, this is what I do know. Uh, from what I, uh, it, it's something specific to Bengal. You don't see that in South Indian temples offering uh, cloth in the RT. Um, my understanding was it's it's offering just cloth uh, as like a gift, how you would receive um, a guest. Yes. It's not necessarily though to dr- you offer some argument and then you're drying them down. Right. Uh, um, but maybe there's some other evidence. The way uh, the way I was uh, taught in Mayapur in the academy is that the argum so the whole thing is a reception. The whole mm-hmm. ceremony is a reception. So. Uh, the argum is that water that you're sprinkling on the head to refresh someone. And then the, the, the cloth is like you said, you're receiving someone. You see in India, sometimes when you go to a guest house or they're receiving the president of, you, of India or something, they give them a cloth around their, around a shawl, a shawl or something. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, the argument is either it's a refresh or to wash the hands. All right. Debate on that. But, uh, oh, really? I didn't know that. Achman, yeah, podium for your feet, achman for your mouth, and argium hasta, uh, hasta uh, for the hands. To oh, wash interesting. The hands. Okay. But sometimes it's used uh, for the heads, a different mix of things. But there's some, maybe it's uh, contextual as well. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to skip certain ones, uh, just in the interest of time here. Um, what thoughts are there, if any, on continuing Archana in temples during the present pandemic? What can we do to ensure communities are kept safe, but worship goes on? Uh, this is a it's gone. Lester has a nice solution. Would be good to see what others are currently doing. Hmm. I wish I knew what their solution was. Well, I read the I read the ISKCON DD ministry. Um, you know, they had a they had an announcement regarding okay, yeah. you know, get rid of the con shells, don't do uh, you know, don't smell the flowers, don't send that around. Basically, kind of practical things so contagious diseases are not spread. Uh, the con shell thing is something that's been blowing my mind. No pun intended for for uh, <laughs> <laughs> for for twenty years. The like the bowl where everyone pours the water and then just the bowl of it just like the like, water just sits and there like yeah. and yeah. festers. Oh, so gross. I think that there needs to be a better solution for that, and that just pouring water is somehow going to cl clean it. Yeah. No one, I, you, you know, I don't know when the last time I saw someone like really scrubbing it with a sponge. <laughs> and what sponge are you using? Are you using the Didi sponge? That's a good one. I mean, it's it's it gets really gross, and the, yeah, there's yeah. like so much that it's just full of spit. Yeah, I know, totally. So, I mean, maybe maybe someone's gonna say I'm an atheist for saying that. I don't know, but no, 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 no it needs to be. And it really, it's really like it needs to be thought of, teased out a little bit more in terms of how we're gonna how how cleanliness can be maintained with that. Yes. Um, true. So, it, that's a, a really good question and a timely question. So I, I was, talked to my teacher, Dr. Shelva, uh, Shelva Pila Ayengar, a little bit, who comes from the Stanacharya. We talked about it last time, but um, from a Stanacharya family in Melkote. So their fam his family was made to be the caretakers of the Melkote Choluvanarayana Swami Temple by Ramanuja Acharya. And he has a PhD in iconography and his focus is on agamas, pancharatric agamas. So he's my, my teacher. And so I asked him specifically about this. The pancharatra body of literature really anticipates all sorts of situations. Hmm. You know, every, you know, okay, what if, what if the, uh, the deity breaks? Well, what kind of break is it? Is it a kanishta, a madhyama, an uttama? So is it just a pinky? Is it an arm? Is the neck broken? How do you fix it how do you, you know like they're all, they they've really thought out not just for 10 years but for a thousand years or two thousand years how is the deity going to be maintained and all the different situations i mean it makes sense there's always famines there's wars um there's all sorts of diseases i mean you still got the plague over there right and uh so i asked him what what is I said, what, what's written? So he said in Ishwara Samhita, um, chapter 19 is devoted to specifically what does one do in the case of a war or a famine? So there's two parts uh, that we discussed. So I can just talk about it briefly. Sure, yeah. Um, I don't know what our, what our time is. Um, uh, we have, we're good on time. We're, okay. we, we have another like 15, 20 minutes. Okay, so in... The first case of, say, you're doing an utsava, and it's interrupted. So, they, I mean, they really, it, it's just an amazing body of literature. They really anticipate everything. So they say, okay, so what if you're doing brahmotsavam? Brahmotsavam is 11 days. And something happens, there's a war or something, or some, some calamity happens, you miss the first three, one to three days of it. What do you do? Okay, so then you have to compress everything into this day, you double certain, ele certain uh, elements afterwards. Then, okay, what if it goes into four days? Then you do this. 
Then what if it goes into five days? What if you go into six? I mean, they, each day right. they have a solution for it. Then after a certain, uh, the ninth day is uh, fixed according to the nakshatra and everything. So then they say, if it's after the ninth day, then you wait one full month. And each, at each point, there's different prayas chitta. So there's different things that one has to do for forgiveness, whether it's uh, shanti homa or a different type of abhishek. Then after one month, one, if, if it, you do for the next month uh, for the same nakshatra, okay? Then you, you just have to add, uh, I think it's sahasra kalash abhishek, so 1,000 kalash abhishek. No big deal. Wow. Uh, and 10,000 mantra japas of uh, one Narasimha mantra. And I think a Shanti Homa. Then it, if it goes on, then you can wait. Basically, it can go on for like, I think a year. You can have it delayed. And then after a certain point, then you don't redo the whole thing. You just have to do, I think maybe that's when you do the thousand Kalash Abhishek. Okay, so that's Brahmotsava. No one does Brahmotsava Mitzkan. But this is just an example. You know, the same would happen for other Utsavas. So, Right now, we basically have to look at it like uh, an eclipse or some other inauspicious time. So okay. maybe, maybe not to that level because we can still continue on with the seva, but most of the temples are going to be closed. And we have to be more careful with it. So at least for, like I was talking to one devotee about um, doing samskars and, and pujas. I said, you know, you just be careful. You should, now is the time we can go internally and, and oh. develop our own strength as, as prohitas, as archikas. And, you know, then we have more to offer. So right. in terms of the daily seva, yeah, the, I read that letter that was sent out, um, like what you had said about the conscious. Um, I think the point about bringing our own achman cup. I think it was really following all the rules that we're supposed to be doing, but really, really. <laughs> so. so <laughs> then the question comes, obviously, a lot of the temples are not going to have, and they shouldn't, are not going to be able to have um, pujaris from outside coming in all the time. Mm. Because it's, we, you don't know what's, what, their, what their situation, especially with a, a, a virus like this, it can be inactive. People really just need to like put up walls and... <laughs> And just wait, wait this out. So how are, how is the deity maintained? And I'm saying this not as someone who's part of the Iskand deity worship ministry. I'm not giving any official things. I'm just saying what um, what it says in uh, Ishvara Samhita. So this is just an example. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to give that caveat. Good disclaimer. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to give a disclaimer. I don't want the Shema Kavacha Prabhu. Uh, to call me because I don't, I don't, I'm not giving, telling people what they should be doing. I'm just right. explaining what. Although he, what, although you are consulted at times for certain things. So we should, I, I don't know. We should also, you, you have that credibility. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, I, I help them with things, but I don't know that. I, I don't know what weight I have on anything, but um. Anyway, let's get it. Let's get yeah, yeah, yeah. it. So, so, so in it, it, it was interesting. Basically, it says you continue doing everything. So if there are different um, levels. So I asked, okay, what if there's no flowers? I said, okay, then you use akshata. So rice with, mixed with turmeric and you chant the, the mantra um, while offering that instead. If there's no boga. So say you miss one boga offering. Um, I mean, there's, there's, Every instance, and there's price, different price shittas for each one. Um, if you miss a boga offering, then there's a specific price shitta for that. We can discuss in a second. Um, if maybe there's not the same amount of fruit, like we can't get all the fruit from the market that we would or all the boga offerings, you offer what you can offer. Then when it's available, you offer double. Oh, wow. Um, and... What was it? I think it's after a certain, there's, depending on the amount of time that the seva is neglected or there's some compromise in the seva, then there are different levels of prayashita that has to be done. So mm -hmm. whether it's a, a day, three days, a week, a month, or multiple months, 
then there are different price shifters, namely um, an Abhishek, and depending on the amount of time, then the Abhishek is more involved and uh, more kaloshes, and a Homa and Japa. After three years, then you have to, if there's no seva going on at all after three years, then you have to do pratishta over again. But that's after three years. Wow. Um, with, with no seva, completely no seva. So there's minimal amounts of seva. So you have to figure out, you know, how to keep the relationship there. And the, but after the main thing is, is whatever you do are doing now, it's for, because of survival. Right. It's, you know, it's not because it's, it's, there's only so much one, like if there's only one Pujari, there's only so much they can do, or maybe there's not enough Boga to maintain that uh, standard right now because yeah. you can't go outside or you can't get things or, you know, so you have to figure that out. And, but the thing is, is after it's done, then there has to be some Utsava to reconnect the congregation. I mean, part of it is, to re-enthuse the relationship between the deity and the, uh, and the archikas and the congregants. So more japa is done of the, of the mantras that we were talking about before. Abhishek is done. This is with all different herbal things and, and to clean the area right. thoroughly because it's, you know, this whole area is being contaminated. So you have to really clean everything and start fresh and then Homa is done. So all these things and all those herbs, all the things that are used, they all have specific significance. Um, even so say for instance, when there is, I was reading one article about um, the processions in, in Panchratric temples. So they go on a procession and Again, Agamas really think really long term. They're not just thinking about like a year or two. They're thinking a hundred years. So what's the archivability of a particular um, Murti over a long period of time? How did the elements start to wear away? Oh, and their, um, uh, what's, what's the right word? How, we, how they may look like their material the material elements that they appear to be in, let's say, okay, whether it's granite or, or, or bronze or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So when the small Morty go, that's part of the thing is we have to be clean to go in because we're bringing all the stuff off the street if we go right in and onto the altar. And all those particulates that are in the air then fall on the deity. And then all those acids and, you know, all those non-archival things, all the oils and everything, they start to wear away at the cloth, at the um, granite, at the bronze. And over time, it starts to destroy the Morty form. Mm -hmm. So like if they take a procession, they'll take the deities out in procession, but then they'll wash him afterwards when he comes back and, and, and give him, do Abhishek for both the Murti to be clean, but also because they're bringing that small Murti back onto the altar. So they're gonna bring all the stuff from the street, all the, all the dust that's in the air that's filled with stool and everything, especially, you know, like go in India, everything dries up and then it's all in the air. Right. So all of these things, if you follow these rules, you don't have so many issues with uh, all these viruses, mm -hmm. but it's very, very hard. and and imperceivable in a lot of ways um but what we oh yeah so what do you do so the main thing is is each temple has to figure out this stuff on their own what's what their ability is and then afterwards if there is some compromise then they have to have some utsava afterwards to re reconnect themselves and their congregation i mean it'll be it's therapeutic especially after something like this where everyone can come together and do sankirtan that's congregational chanting yes, yes. and and reconnect to the deity re reconfirm their relationship with the deity that's what the brahmots of them is um anyways and so if there is some compromise then they figure out what those things are and then they um reconnect with the with the deity very good points great points um let's move on here uh, yeah. What is the best way to learn how to do all that 
meaning deity worship, if we live in the middle of nowhere with no temple around? Mm -hmm. Well, there's the internet. I think um, right. it's very lucky nowadays. It, I mean, really, that, that old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. I learned whatever I learned because whenever I did meet someone, I would just ask them as many questions as possible. I would look at, I mean, there was a lot less literature. Um, I mean, I would look at, I, I'm just speaking for myself and my experience as an example. I remember looking at those old bridge bossy spirits. Did you ever see those? The New Vrindavan newsletter? Yeah, yeah. And, and I would look at them and there was like pictures of Gorkeshava Prabhu doing uh, installations and stuff. And I would just try and read whatever I could, look at the pictures, try and understand what it was. Yeah. If I found someone that was there, I would ask them, what, what was this? What was this? And they would just tell me whatever they could remember. Sometimes yeah. it was wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, so there was a lot of unlearning that I had to do when I finally, uh, you know, met people like Gorke Shoh Prabhu um, and, and others. And, you know, whenever I would meet someone who maybe learned something in Mayapur or learned something in South India, I would corner them and ask them as many questions until they completely got sick of me. And then whenever I would find some book that came out, uh, I would just read it cover to cover. So it's really just about, you know, if you have a desire, then you can really get into the stuff. But especially now, because there's YouTube, there's so much information online. There's websites like uh, Ram Ramanujacharya's uh, Sri Matam uh, website has so many online resources with, with so many texts explaining so much in really understandable ways. Uh, I mean, his, his website is just a, amazing resource for understanding ritualism um there's so i mean like I, for myself i just look up if i find something i'll just look it up on youtube um like if i'm just to watch like a homa or watch an abhishek yeah and it's not like it's not the same at all like learning from someone and you have to find some eventually you need to find you can get a lot of information and be exposed to a lot more by looking at stuff, but you need to eventually you need to find a teacher and yeah. and learn from them and and learn systematically. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's I mean, whatever I've learned is I've gained some things by reading as much as I can, whatever, uh, whether it's academic essays or um, prayogs or procedures or watching videos, but it's mostly sitting and actually with a teacher that's been the most helpful to really systematically go through because there's a lot of different people have different styles of doing things that are all shastric but there may be some slight variations so you really have to have a teacher right that's the main thing you know and luckily we have things like zoom who's <laughs> behind the coronavirus <laughs> I think there's certain there's certain good stocks like Zoom and uh, sweatpants futures that, uh, <laughs> that I think are really good in this economy. Right. And uh, you can learn so much. And there's there's many people who who are willing to share and Great. and learn. Great. Um, lastly, uh, what are the qualifications and or prerequisites for having your own deities? Uh, initiation is that I would say I would say initiation is the prerequisite for having a deity okay. after that then it's up to you know your guru having blessings of your guru your relationship with with your guru and and having you know but mainly the main thing is is that mantra japa right okay um since so that, that was a quick one uh, the, the last question on this thread was how important is deity worship in the life of a devotee in regard to maintaining sattva guna? And how do you maintain a high standard of worship while living in a city? Good question. It's hard. It's hard. I don't think it's a matter of having to have a high standard or a low standard. It's just a matter of having some sort of standard. Right. What may be high for one person may be low for someone else. Generally, there are certain minimum standards depending on you know what you're doing. 
um, it's it's a it's a challenge, and there's going to be ups and downs, like with everything else in spiritual life. Yeah, uh, it's it's important because it does help to cultivate sattva gun, because we're stupid, and unless we have a specific reason to do something, mm -hmm. and we don't do it, so yeah. because we have to be clean. I mean, it's it's because we have to be clean to. Uh, worship the deity. We have to be freshly showered. Then we shower. Some some days it's hard, you know. Some days you're having a rough day, but you think, okay, I have to do my deity worship. So I gotta sh take a shower. I gotta change. I gotta put on fresh clothes. Can't eat yet, so I have to do the deity worship. Some right. days you run out and you're ready to do it, but it helps to create parameters for Sattva Gun to grow because deity worship is, of course, transcendent to the gunas, but it is situated um, on foundationally in order to start doing deity worship, you have to situate yourself in Sattva Guna. Right. Uh, following all these different rules and parameters in order to engage with it all. Right, right. So I think, I, I mean, for me, I think it's really an important thing as we try and create a Sattvic environment for ourselves. Definitely. Well, that's the uh, that's most of the questions, uh, and and we're out of time here. But thanks you, thank you so much, Brahma, for for taking uh, this time out to to come and speak with us on on the importance of deity worship and all the different questions we had. I think uh, people are going to get a lot of out of it. And, yeah, uh, maybe we can do it again. See. No, no, totally. We only do only deity. We can talk about other stuff. Do this. Oh, I'd love to talk about other stuff. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, I'm going to figure out how to maybe bring this in, maybe bring Facebook in, bring Instagram in, maybe put it all together so we can get some live thing going. Also, my internet is pretty bad, so I don't know how it's going to take all the, um, the bandwidth, but let's see. But anyways, this is... Yeah, we can talk about prepping. Well, what, how do we do deity worship in, in, the, in the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how would how would how would Rick Grimes approach uh, deity worship? <laughs> I think those are all important things. How do, what what are the essential things for our go bag? Uh, <laughs> yes, and Sandhya and, and Puja. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we can make an Amazon list and share. That'll be great. We'll share in, it in the in the link below. <laughs> okay, Brahma. Thank you. All right. How do you, how do you? I'm just gonna stop recording. All right. Trying to tie.